In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we note and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. This is where we left off yesterday. Matthew 5, 1. Having seen the crowds, he went up the mountain. A mountain is a place of solitude, a place of privacy where uh, both Jesus and the disciples could uh, have a fellowship together. And this is true fellowship in which Jesus Christ would teach to the disciples how to handle such large, cr large crowds and also teach to them uh, some of the doctrines related to the age of Israel. And we have to keep in mind that when Jesus Christ is speaking in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, 3 and following that, when Jesus Christ is speaking here, he's talking about the millennium and also the age of Israel. Actually, Matthew 5, 3 and onward from there is an upgrade of the Mosaic Law. And at this time, it's the age of Israel. They're still under the Mosaic Law as they should be. And Jesus Christ is uh, teaching to them the kingdom, that is the 1,000 year reign, and how that is going to be and how they should act in the 1,000 year reign. After he sat down, which, which indicates he had a relaxed mental attitude, Jesus Christ was very relaxed uh, uh, sitting on the mountain with the disciples. His disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and continually taught them by repeating these things. And I don't know what your translation says, but this is the corrected translation from the Greek in which Jesus Christ continually repeated these doctrines to the disciples. And that is so they would be able to retain these things. The things that you uh, remember in life are those things that have been repeated over and over again. And the same as if you join the military, uh, they make you follow a procedure over and over again. And when you follow that procedure uh, so many different times, then it becomes cemented in your brain how you should function. So he began to teach the disciples doctrines concerning the age of Israel, and that's important because all of these things that follow deal with the age of Israel and the spiritual life of Israel along with the spiritual life that will be established in the millennium. The millennium is the 1,000-year reign of Christ which follows the tribulation. So in making application for this age, and we can make some application from the Beatitudes to our age, but in making application for our age, the church age, we must always keep in mind that all of these things will be used in the millennium, and they are really not for us, although application can be made. And we will begin to look at now the Beatitudes in chapter 5, verse 3. Now we start out with blessed and usually uh, 5, 3, 5, 4 and continuing start out with the word blessed. This word actually means inner happiness and the Greek word for this is makari or makarios that is M-A-K-A-R-I. Now it's a very old Greek word and at one point it came to mean person. Makario, or, or, or yes, Makari, it, it came to mean person. And then uh, because of relationship with God, we have a great happiness. This word is used in 1 Timothy 1.11 and in Titus 2.13. And it refers to inner happiness. It's not uh, just a blessed as in you will receive blessings. It's actually inner happiness. So in 5.3, we have a description of salvation 
blessing. This is the first blessing mentioned. Salvation blessing. And then the verse says this. Inner happiness, makario or makarios, is available to the destitute of spiritual assets. That's the corrected translation. And who is the destitute of spiritual assets? The unbeliever, the unregenerate. Those who haven't believed in Christ are destitute of spiritual assets. So what it's saying is inner happiness is available to the unbeliever, those destitute of spiritual assets. Because, the, because of them, the kingdom of heaven exists. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> because of them, <coughs> the kingdom of heaven exists. And this is so that all of the re unregenerate, all of the unbelievers, all of us at birth, actually, are born unregenerate. We do not have a human spirit. We are dichotomous, not trichotomous, which means we are unspiritual, unregenerate. And so because of them, because of us, actually, the kingdom of heaven exists. So that all of the unregenerate, all the unbelievers, which includes all of us at birth, might become regenerate and believe in Christ. So that's the meaning of verse uh, chapter 5, verse 3. Inner happiness is available to the destitute of spiritual assets, the unbeliever. Because of them, the kingdom of heaven exists so that all of us can come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and come to know him as our Savior. In chapter 5, verse 4, chapter 5, 4 deals with blessing in time. 5.3 deals with the salvation blessing. 5.4 deals with blessing in time. That means uh, you as a believer living on the earth, your blessing in time. Inner happiness, and this is related to relationship to God. Inner happiness belong to those, and this is believers, inner happiness belong to those believers who suffer. Now this refers to suffering for blessing. It does not refer to suffering for a punishment because all of us can uh, fall under suffering for punishment. When we go out of fellowship and we do not name our sins to God and we are in carnality and we uh, get to a point where we don't even care for the word of God called reversionism, then we will have suffering. But that suffering is designed so that we will wake up to the spiritual life. This is referring to the believer who is suffering for blessing, and that is to suffer uh, because they're living the spiritual life and they're under testing. So, inner happiness belongs to those who suffer for blessing because they will be comforted. Now, this uh, phrase, they will be comforted, this is actually an, an immediately, uh, an immediate type thing. It's biological progression. It's not something that you anticipate. It's not something that you go under suffering and then say to yourself, well, I will suffer now, but uh, later on I will be comforted. No, it's logical progression in the Greek, which means the comfort comes immediately. You're under suffering, you're immediately comforted by the word of God, which you should know and do know if you're suffering for blessing. So this is an immediate thing by logical progression, not something to be anticipated, but something that occurs logically by God's grace. So when you are tested and you suffer because of that testing, you will be comforted, not a year down the line, but immediately as a result of your suffering, you'll be comforted by the word of God that is in your soul. And then we have chapter 5, verse 5. Chapter 5, 5 deals with eternal blessing. So we see a logical progression here. Chapter 5, 3 deals with salvation, salvation blessing. Then after we're saved, we have blessing in time, ch uh, chapter 5, 4. And then after we have blessing in time, we have eternal blessing, chapter 5, 5. So it's very logical. Matthew chapter 5, 5, this deals with eternal blessing. Inner happiness belongs to the grace-oriented. Now remember, this is given to the Jewish audience. This is referring to the Jewish believer. And then it goes on to say, because they will inherit the land. 
Now, if we were to try to apply this verse to us today, well, it would result in a flawed conclusion because you would read 5.5 in thinking that it applies to us. And you would say, inner happiness belongs to the grace-oriented. And you would say to yourself, yes, I'm grace-oriented. And then you'll continue to read and say, because they will inherit the land. And then you will say, I will inherit the land. What land are you going to inherit? This is for the Jew. The land that they are going to inherit is in the millennial reign of Christ. And this is dealing actually with the tribulational believer who will be Jewish believers and in the tribulation they will follow Christ and they will be grace oriented and therefore they will inherit the land and when Jesus Christ returns in the millennium after the resurrection of the church of course and then seven years of tribulation then in the millennium well they will inherit the land and that means that the Jews the Jewish believers during the tribulation like the generals who are winners in the tribulation will inherit land and Jesus Christ will apportion to them a certain amount of land as part of their reward so this deals with Jews not with us but the application for us would be we too must be grace oriented there's blessing in us in being great grace oriented and actually it's a far greater blessing than is given to those Jews in the millennium when we become grace oriented it means that we've been utilizing our spiritual assets it means we've been filled with God the Holy Spirit it means we've been naming our sins to God it means we have been learning the Word of God and it means that we have become grace oriented and that in itself has blessing in time but also eternal reward for us so there's application to us but as far as inheriting the land no, that is uh, reserved for the Jew. Now, in the millennium, we are given reward, actually, before the millennium begins. And, so, and if you go to spiritual maturity, you will be the ruler over a portion of land as a uh, person who has went the full length of your spiritual life. So you will rule over uh, some country in the millennium or some city or some uh, nation or something like that. Uh, but this is an inheritance of that occur, occurs in eternity. Now this is dealing with eternal blessing in that the Jews in the future will be given the ability to inherit the land during Christ's millennial reign. Now in chapter 5, verse 6. Inner happiness belongs to those who hunger and thirst. What does this mean? Inner happiness belongs to those who hunger and thirst. Well, if you were to think about it literally, you would say everyone hungers and thirsts. We do. Uh, at a certain time of day when we haven't had food, we hunger. And if we haven't drank enough water throughout the day, we begin to have thirst. But that's not what it's referring to. This is analogous to positive volition. Are you hungry for the word of God? Do you thirst for the word of God? Inner happiness belongs to those who hunger and thirst. The object of this is the Word of God. They hunger and thirst for the Word of God. Inner happiness belongs to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now this is referring to capacity righteousness. In the Greek, it's dikaiosune. And dikaiosune, excuse me, deals with capacity righteousness. And so they hunger and thirst for the Word of God. They hunger and thirst to grow in grace and in knowledge because they will be satisfied. This is the gnomic present tense that sets up satisfaction as a result of a logical uh, progression. Now that sounds a bit uh, highfalutin. What it means is that uh, because you are positive toward doctrine, because you learn the word of God, you will be satisfied. That's all it means. So inner happiness belongs to those who hunger and thirst, to those who are positive to the word of God and want to learn it, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, capacity righteousness, because they will be satisfied. The, satis the, the, satis the satisfaction, satisfaction, the satisfaction comes from learning the word of God, and that is where your satisfaction lies. And then in chapter 5, verse 7, Inner happiness belongs 
to the grace oriented. Now this has to do with a mental attitude of grace from your application of grace to experience. This is actually our Christian way of life and the Christian way of life cannot be achieved without learning the word of God. So we note from this that in the millennium there will actually be grace orientation and there will be a mental attitude of application of grace to experience the Christian way of life. And so uh, this is something that will be true in the millennium. They will have grace orientation in the millennium. We have it today. But as it stands now and as it stands written from uh, Matthew uh, 5, 7, it appears as if the highest uh, place that the tribulational saints and the millennial saints will be able to go is grace orientation. Beyond that, they cannot achieve because, remember, we are the age of power. In the uh, tribulation, uh, they will not have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. In the millennium, they will have the filling of God the Holy Spirit, but it will be used in a different way. And they just don't have the assets that we have, not even in the future. Today, we have something phenomenal, something that they will not have in the millennium. And Christ is teaching these things uh, to people as if they were about to go into the millennium because he had to offer grace first before he would uh, cut them off and say, okay, there needs to be a church age because they failed. That is, Israel will fail and they will fall under the fifth cycle of discipline in August of 70 AD. But for now, he's preaching to them as if they will all change their mind about Christ. So he is saying you need to be grace-oriented in the millennium. And it has application today because we too should be grace-oriented. Then in chapter 5, verse 8. Inner happiness belongs to the pure in the frontal lobe. That is the corrected translation. Now, who are the pure of heart, as your Bible might say? Where it says, uh, uh, blessed uh, be the one who is pure of heart, or something to that effect. It actually means inner happiness belongs to the pure in the frontal lobe. That means they're in fellowship with God. How are we pure? You know we do have an old sin nature, so our purity doesn't have to deal with legalism. Our purity doesn't have to deal with our mode of conduct or our mode of dress. And just because you dress up nicely, or because uh, you, as I've seen many people do, grow a very long white beard and they might carry a cane like Moses did in the Old Testament and you say, whoa, that person looks like a prophet or they look, uh, they look eccentric. Well, that's all they do is they look that way. In their souls, they are not that way. You are not uh, blessed because of how you dress or because of how you look. You, are not, you do not have inner happiness because you follow certain taboos. That's not what this is related to. Purity is related to the fact you're in fellowship. It means you've named your sins to God. And when you name your sins to God, you are purified. Apart from yourself, it's because Christ died as a substitute for you. And when you name that sin to God, God says, all right, you're forgiven because Christ died as a substitute for that sin that you have named. So it is a grace procedure to name your sins to God. And so when you name your sins to God on a consistent basis, you will be pure in your frontal lobe. And that means you will be in fellowship with God. Because they will see, this is the next phrase, because they will see God. Now what does that mean? It doesn't mean they will uh, see God as, uh, well, God the Father. They won't see God the Father. It means they will perceive, understand. It's an idiom. They will see God. They will perceive him, understand him, much as we perceive and understand God. None of us have ever seen God. If you think you have, you need to go to a mental institution. None of us have ever seen God. But we can perceive God and we can understand God because they will perceive, understand God. And the only way to come to understand God is through the word of God. This refers to perception metabolization and application of the word of God. That's in Matthew chapter 5, 8. Now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Inner happiness belongs to those. Now this word those refers to believers. You see the first verse dealt with the unbeliever and how they could have happiness, inner happiness, by believing in Christ and following the system. 
But now we are dealing with uh, specifically believers. Inner happiness belongs to those believers who declare the peace. Now this is definitely not a reference to world peace. And a lot of people confuse this passage as dealing with world peace. Inner happiness belongs to those believers who declare peace. This is not world peace. They don't go around saying uh, there will be peace because our Lord Jesus Christ himself made it very clear that there would be wars and rumors of wars until he comes. And that means until the millennium. There will be wars and rumors of war throughout the church age. What are wars? Well, that's what we're in today. What are rumors of wars? Those are cold wars. That's what we were in with the Soviet Union. For some of you, you were born almost after that. You were born after that time, after the Cold War. Well, that would be rumors of war. I grew up during that time, so uh, when uh, the children would play and I would play with the children, uh, well, one of us would be USA, the other one would be USSR. And, of course, USA always won, as we did. So uh, what occurred is a Cold War. We won that Cold War. Actually, we never really fire, fired a shot at the Russians. We just defeated them uh, in a Cold War. They were always our enemy, but they just fell apart eventually, thanks to God's grace and Ronald Reagan. So uh, chapter 5, verse 9. Inner happiness belongs to those believers who declare peace, the peace. What is the peace? doesn't have to do with world peace that is not sustainable. It's not possible in the devil's world. It's not a reference to world peace, but is, it is a reference to the doctrine of reconciliation. The doctrine of reconciliation means that mankind can be at peace with God. Before we believe in Christ, we are enemies of God. Before we believe in Christ, well, we can have no relationship with God. We are his enemy. When we believe in Christ, we've made peace with God. The doctrine of reconciliation. So who are those who declare the peace? Well, they're declaring the gospel. It's like an evangelist or a pastor who gets up and says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. They are declaring peace. They're declaring peace between man and God, saying, look, you believe in Christ and you will have peace between you and God. That is what this verse refers to. Not world peace, but to the doctrine of reconciliation. This doctrine of peace is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. And I give you that because 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20 talks about peace with God. Also, Ephesians chapter 2, 13 through 18. So declaring the, the peace refers to the presentation of the gospel. Inner happiness belongs to those believers who declare the peace, the gospel of Christ, because they will be called the children of God. So that is part of their reward in the millennium for uh, declaring the fact that Jesus Christ is their Savior. Then in chapter 5, verse 10, inner happiness is available to those who are persecuted on account of righteousness. Of them is the kingdom of heaven. Now being persecuted on behalf of Christ means that you will receive reward. This does not refer to, however, uh, persecution as a result of divine discipline. Sometimes we could get out of line and go under persecution, and that's just part of God trying to wake us up and say, hey, name your sins to God, and get in fellowship and get back with the Word of God. This is not what uh, 510 refers to, not those outside of fellowship. Again, 510, inner happiness is available to those who are persecuted on account of of righteousness of them is the kingdom of heaven so they are persecuted on account of righteousness because Jesus Christ has perfect righteousness they believe in Christ they too have perfect righteousness when they believe in Christ this also has to deal with the spiritual life in which you have capacity righteousness but when uh, people go out, as it says in 510, and proclaim the peace, that is the gospel of Christ, oftentimes they will be persecuted. And under that uh, persecution, well, they receive blessing for it. Of them is the kingdom of heaven. 
And then in chapter 5, verse 11. Inner happiness is yours when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things about you falsely on my account. And this will occur for anyone who is positive to the Word of God. It will occur to anyone who is growing in grace and in knowledge. Eventually, you'll get to a point where uh, people will insult you because of your interest in the Word, and people will persecute you because of your interest in the Word, and they will say all kinds of evil things about you. But remember, they said the same evil things about Christ, so it's nothing to be concerned with. So this verse does not apply if you react to insults. That is, if you are insulted and then you react, if you are insulted and then you insult them back, this, this verse doesn't apply for that. If I could chew out a cat, a cat I would. But uh, this does not apply if you react to insults. It does not apply if you react to persecution or evil things that are said about you that are false because they are saying these things on, well, on because of Christ, not because of you. You must think highly of yourself if you think they're just down on you because of how great you are. It's really because you're living in the divine dynosphere. And remember the great divide which was taught yesterday. Why does, well, I need to plug it in. <clears throat> Well, this thing's all been up. <clears throat> well, it's just not going to work right now. Anyway, uh, why do people persecute you? Well, if you are under the unique spiritual life, you will be persecuted. And you'll be persecuted because those other people live in the cosmic system, which is Satan's system. And they persecute you almost unknowingly. They don't even hardly have a clue why they hate you. But you should have a clue when you're in the divine dynosphere or living your spiritual life. It's tantamount to the same thing, equal to. So you're living your spiritual life. You will come under condemnation. That will be part of your testing to grow in grace and in knowledge. The same thing will occur with people in the millennium just as it occurs today with people in the church age. So this doesn't apply to you, inner happiness. Uh, when people insult you. It does not apply to you if you react to those people, if you try to take revenge on those people. The inner happiness will be intensified for you under persecution if you are executing God's plan for your life. But always, we can make application from this to our lives, but remember, this is actually written specifically to Jews and specifically to those who will live in the kingdom in the millennium. So it does not actually apply to us in the church age specifically, but we can take some application from these things. Chapter 5, verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. This is a result of having inner happiness. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward is great in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. So when you are persecuted, do not react. In fact, you should rejoice and be glad with, with inner, hap inner happiness in which you have learned enough doctrine to know that the reason you are being persecuted is because of the fact that you're living your spiritual life. And since you're living your spiritual life, uh, you will be attacked, but in that attack you can rejoice and be glad. So those are the Beatitudes, the famous Beatitudes of scripture beginning with chapter 5. Now some of you were writing down the uh, translation, the corrected translation for each of the Beatitudes and I'll go over them quickly uh, one more time with a quick explanation. Chapter 5-3 is salvation blessing. Inner happiness is available to the destitute of spiritual assets, the unbeliever. Because of them, the kingdom of heaven exists. That is, all of us are unregenerate at birth, and because of us, the kingdom of heaven exists. Chapter 5-4 deals with blessing and time. Inner happiness belongs to those believers who suffer, that is, suffering for blessing, because they will be comforted. And the point we got out of that was that the comfort immediately proceeds the suffering. It's not something that they must wait on. The comfort comes from knowing the Word of God, and that, how it, that is how it is presented to us in the Greek. 
And then chapter 5, 5. It deals with eternal blessing. And our happiness belongs to the grace-oriented. This is dealing with the Jewish believer who is grace-oriented because they will inherit the land. What land will they inherit? Not us, the Jewish believers. They will inherit the land in the millennium. So grace orientation will be their spiritual maturity in that day in the millennium. Today we have many more spiritual assets besides simple grace orientation. Chapter 5 verse 6, And her happiness belongs to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This has to do with hungering and thirsting for the word of God, hungering and thirsting for capacity righteousness, dikaiosune in the Greek, which deals with uh, your advance in the spiritual life. Because they will be satisfied. Anyone who is positive toward the word of God will be satisfied by coming to know the word of God through the revelation of God the Holy Spirit in our age. Chapter 5, verse 7. And her happiness belongs to the grace-oriented because they will receive grace in action. This has to do with grace orientation in uh, the millennium. And the mental attitude application of grace to experience which would be the Christian way of life at that time, uh, cannot be achieved without growing in grace and in knowledge, which means those in the millennium will do just about the same thing we do when it comes to the application of the Word of God in their life. And they apply the Word of God to experience, meaning that they can have grace orientation toward people, knowing that people have a sin nature just as they do. Chapter 5, verse 8. Inner happiness belongs to the pure in frontal lobe. That means they're in fellowship with God because they have used the rebound technique. Because they will see. See has to deal with perception and understanding God through His Word, through perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. Chapter 5, verse 9. Inner happiness belongs to those believers who declare peace. Not a reference to world peace, but a reference to the doctrine of reconciliation found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 20 and Ephesians chapter 2, 13 through 18. Declaring the peace refers to the presentation of the gospel because they will be called the children of God as part of their reward. Chapter 5, verse 10. Inner happiness is available to those who are persecuted on account of righteousness. Of them is the kingdom of heaven. Being persecuted on account of righteousness means that you are persecuted because of your life inside the divine dynosphere. You are persecuted because of your life inside your unique spiritual life. You're living a spiritual life that's unique, yet those around you who are Christians are not. So guess what? Christian or non-Christian will persecute you because, well, you're different. You're living a unique spiritual life. They are not. They will attack you. And that is what this is saying. But because you are persecuted on account of capacity righteousness, uh, yours is the kingdom of heaven. And this is referring to the millennial believer. That will be part of their reward for their spiritual life. We already know our rewards, dealing with the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, and all of the eternal rewards related to the Bema seat in which Jesus Christ will evaluate us and know where we went in our spiritual life and reward us on the basis of that. And in uh, verse 11, inner happiness is yours when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things about you falsely on my account. Uh, this occurs today. It will also occur in the tribulation and in the millennium. So it does have application to us since this does occur uh, with us today because those living in the cosmic system will persecute those living in the divine dynosphere or those living their unique spiritual life. So when evil things are said about you or when false things are said about you, just remember uh, the same things were said about Christ so that uh, you can uh, simply rest in the Lord and enter happiness will be for you and it will actually be intensified under persecution because you will be executing God's plan for your life. Then in 512, rejoice and be glad. You will rejoice and be glad as a result of having all of this inner happiness. Remember, this is addressed to Jews. This is how they are to function. It does have some application to us. We are to function in the same manner, except we have a lot more to look forward to because we have much more than simple grace orientation. Because your reward is great in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. Now we're going to take a look at the life of the disciples. And this begins in Matthew chapter 5, verse 
13. And this is Jesus Christ instructing the disciples how they should live. And so he begins in chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt. What is salt? Salt was always used as a preservative in the ancient world in which they would preserve meat with salt so it wouldn't go bad and preserve other things. We have uh, things that we use today that uh, are greater preservatives than then uh, because we have refrigeration and all of that. They didn't. So they used salt to preserve things. And so when Jesus Christ said, You are the salt, this means he is talking to the disciples saying, Look, when you become spiritually mature, you will have the impact of mature, mature believers and you will have an impact on history, which means any of us who go to maturity will be the salt of the earth and we will have an impact on our country. And why haven't we been attacked since September 11th, 2001? Because within this country there are a few people scattered around who act as the salt of the earth and they act as the salt of this country. And that's why today London is bombed, but uh, Washington, D.C. is not. It's not to say that it won't happen, because if uh, people do not get with the word of God in this country, and there's not enough a preservative that is salt, then we will go under even more punishment. 9-11 was a wake-up call for us. Will we wake up and get back with the word of God, or will we just drift along our own merry way until the next attack occurs? Well, we'll find out how history plays out. But you have to know that you individually can have an impact. And you can have an impact on your very country as becoming the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt becomes insipid, how will it function as a preservative? What is this all about? And then he continues to say, It has ability for nothing, having been thrown out. Now, this is dealing with believers outside of fellowship. Uh, the vast majorities of, of believers, the, mass, the vast majority of believers in Israel did not rebound. They did not name their sins to God. Therefore, they were outside of fellowship with God. And the same way as it was then in Israel is the same way it is today. Most believers have no clue concerning 1 John 1, 9, and its significance. And yet we studied from the earlier chapters of this uh, Matthew study that John the Baptist uh, taught the believers how to continually and continuously acknowledge their sins to God. And we studied how John the Baptizer uh, let it be known that uh, they should rebound. Well, very few of them caught on to that and said, yeah, that makes sense. Just rebound, it's grace. Just like me being saved is grace. It makes sense. So they did it. Uh, but not enough did it. So Israel would go out under the fifth cycle of discipline. The same thing is true today because believers don't even have a clue. You say rebound or you say 1 John 1, 9, they think you're talking crazy. They don't know what that's all about, yet they should. It's part of Scripture. And you cannot disregard Scripture uh, just because you think it sounds fallacious. Once scripture speaks, all human discussion should cease. So having been thrown out, this has to do with believers outside of fellowship and trampled underfoot. This is the sin face to face with death. For those people who never rebound, for those people who never use 1 John 1, 9, eventually they will be trampled underfoot by God, meaning they will die the sin face to face with death. They will not go to hell, however. Do not confuse that with going to hell. The sin face to face with death applies only to those who have believed in Christ. And they die a horrible death, but as soon as they die, they depart from this earth and go to be with the Lord because they believed in Christ. The fact that they didn't learn rebound, well, they, they failed in their spiritual life. But if they believed in Christ, they're going to heaven. And even though they failed, well, they will be ashamed for failing but they'll be in heaven and they'll be glad to be there. And that's grace. And then in 514, you are the light of the world. This is indicating that the disciples will be the light of the world just as Christ is the light of the world. This is indicating they will follow in Christ's footsteps. 
This is indicating, uh, this is almost like prophecy because the disciples at this time didn't know too much doctrine. But Christ is saying, look, you are the light of the world. You're going to grow in grace and in knowledge just as I did. And I'm the light of the world. You too will be the light of the world because you will follow the same spiritual life I've lived. This is him talking very personally with the disciples. So that was an encouragement to them, for them to know that they will follow in the footsteps of Christ and they too will be the light of the world, just as we can be if we live our spiritual life. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. Remember, we are dealing with the church, With actually we are dealing with the age of Israel. And during the age of Israel, uh, those with doctrine become visible heroes. Remember, in the church age, we are invisible heroes. So what he's saying here, he's dealing with people who are in the age of Israel. So he says a city located on a hill cannot be hidden. Well, just as David, who lived the spiritual life, it could not be hidden. Everyone knew about David. He became very famous. Why? He was a visible hero. Why did he become a visible hero? Because of his positive volition. Jesus Christ is still speaking to them as if it is the age of Israel. And everyone in the age of Israel who executes the plan of God will be a visible hero. Not invisible. Everybody will know them. But not today. This is a different age. The church age. We become invisible heroes. And I will amplify that when we get to the crucifixion of the cross on the cross because when Christ was crucified and for the three hours he was being judged for all of our sins darkness fell all over the earth he was invisible to everyone yet during that time he was doing the most heroic thing ever done so we too follow in his footsteps to be invisible heroes but he's talking to Israel and he's saying look you go positive toward the Word of God a city on a hill cannot be hidden you will be a visible hero and since he is teaching this in Matthew, it's as if he's teaching this to those uh, tribulational heroes. In the tribulation, there will be about five generals who uh, will execute their spiritual life at that time. They will be visible heroes. All of the uh, Jews will know them as the great generals, and especially when Jesus Christ comes down and helps them out and totally annihilates all the enemy, including Satan and his demon armies, when Jesus Christ sets foot and destroys all of the forces against Israel, those five generals will become instantly visible heroes, and they will be visible heroes throughout the entirety of the millennium. Well, that is their visible heroship, and this is what Christ is saying to those in the tribulation and to those in the millennium. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. You will be visible heroes. Now, we, of course, are different as invisible heroes. Chapter 5, verse 15. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before all mankind, so that they can see your divine good deeds. This uh, divine good deeds, well, I'll tell you all about this in a minute, so that they can see your good deeds, as your Bible says. This is dealing with uh, divine good, not human good. We've studied the difference in the past. And give honor to your Father in heaven. Now the motivational virtue behind this means honoring God the Father. And they want to honor God the Father. Uh, because, and because they want to honor God the Father from motivational virtue, this results in functional virtue. So that uh, while the world cannot see our motivation, the world can't see our motivation. The world doesn't know our motivation. Uh, they might be able to see our functional virtue in that we have tranquility in life. And someone might see you and say, hey, I notice you live a very tra tranquil life. How do you do that? And then you might be able to say, well, get with the word of God as I have, and you too will have a tranquil life. Or you might give them the gospel of Christ. If they're not believers, that's exactly what you should do at first. But remember that all of this in Matthew chapter 5 is dealing with a visible impact. 
And, and this is before God the Holy Spirit uh, would fill us. And when and God the Holy Spirit is invisible, therefore our impact is invisible. So we must always keep a distinction and rightly divide the word of truth, as the Bible tells us to do, so that we can know uh, from what dispensation our, our Lord is talking about. Here he is describing tribulation and millennium. Now we're going to have next an amplification of the Mosaic law. And remember this too is a talking to Israelites. And remember the Israelites were given the Mosaic law by Moses. And he taught them everything dealing with the Mosaic law. The Ten Commandments, all of the dietary laws. You see the Jews could not eat pork. The Jews uh, could not eat certain hooved animals. That was part of their dietary laws. And a lot of the Jews still follow those dietary laws today. But it was for Israel, not for us. The Mosaic law was given to Israel. And Jesus Christ right now is dealing with an audience of Israelites. And Jesus Christ himself created the Mosaic law. So what's hilarious, and we'll get to this later, what's hilarious about all the scribes and Pharisees, they're trying to teach Jesus how to live by the law, and he created the law. Well, they're just so full of themselves, they don't even understand that. So we have an amplification of the Mosaic law to the Israelites. And don't uh, go away thinking after uh, reading this that we have to live under the Mosaic law. We don't. They did. So he's teaching Israelites in 517. Do not presume that I have come to nullify the law. That's dealing with the Mosaic law. He's talking to Israelites. Do not presume that I have come to nullify the Mosaic law or the prophets. I have come not to nullify, but to fulfill. And Christ did fulfill the Mosaic law. He fulfilled both codex number one of, Mosa of the Mosaic law and he fulfilled codex number two uh, when he died on the cross as a substitute for us. So he did fulfill all the law. And during his time on the earth when he was to fulfill the law, he wasn't there at that time to nullify the law. He wasn't there to say, listen Jews, I am your king, I have arrived, uh, forget the Mosaic law. Absolutely not. He's saying, I have arrived, it is still the dispensation of Israel, you're still a client nation and I must present this to you, but just realize I'm not here, Israelites, to nullify the Mosaic law, but to fulfill it. And that's what he's saying. Although today in the church age, we aren't commanded to live under Israel's law. That would be stupid. We live under the laws of the United States of America. We are not citizens of Israel. We do not follow the Mosaic law. We're, we don't have to. And all of that is described in Romans, if you're curious about that. Now, the Apostle Paul all throughout Romans says, we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. Then in 518, still speaking to Jews, for the record, until heaven and earth pass away, not one yod or seraph. Now, the yod is the smallest Hebrew letter. So he's making a point. Not even the smallest of the Hebrew letters will be taken away. Or seraph. And the seraph is a projection on a Hebrew letter. And I don't know. Uh, I took German. And when I took German, uh, they had a, a thing over the O in which the O would be an O. And it's called an umlaut. And it's two dots, dot, dot, right over the O. And well, that is like a serif in the Hebrew where they would just make a dash over a letter. We don't have much of that in English except they say, dot your I's and cross your T's. So, in, so a serif would be the dotting of an I for us, but we don't really follow that type of language. So just think, uh, not even the dotting of an I will, will be a, a pass from the law until everything becomes a reality. Everything will become a reality at the cross. And Jesus Christ would be the only person to ever fulfill the Mosaic Law. And the Mosaic Law, remember, was designed not for God's pleasure. The Mosaic Law was designed for mankind. 
The Mosaic law was designed so that the Israelites could have freedom. Thou shalt not murder. That's one of the things in the Mosaic law. Thou shalt not murder. And why not? Because if you go around killing people, you deprive them of their freedom to live. Thou shalt not steal. That means don't take their property. If you go around and steal people's property, you are taking away their freedom to accumulate property. Also taking away their freedom to live under capitalism. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's part of freedom. A husband should be free to have a wife without concern of a husband stealing her in adult, or not a husband, or of a paramour or someone else stealing the wife in adultery. We'll study that under adultery, which uh, we'll begin tomorrow. And tomorrow we'll talk about adultery because Christ does. We'll talk about all the reasons for it, uh, why it's legitimate in some cases, and how you could actually uh, get a divorce and as a result of having a divorce and then remarrying actually still commit adultery uh, because you followed the laws of uh, the United States instead of looking at uh, how adultery is actually viewed in Scripture. So what we have here, uh, for the record, until heaven and earth pass away, not one yod or seraph will pass from the law until everything becomes a reality. And today, the, the Mosaic law is explicitly uh, given to us in the Old Testament. And it's there for us in the Old Testament, and not one yod or seraph has yet been taken away from the Mosaic law. Yet uh, we do not live under it. So anyone who infringes upon the least of one of these commands and teaches others to do this will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. This is dealing with uh, the Jews. They will, if, if one of the Jews were to get up and say, nah, don't follow the uh, Mosaic law. This is before Christ fulfilled everything. Uh, before Christ fulfilled everything, if a, a Jewish scholar or anyone would get up and say, don't follow the Mosaic law, there's something better. Well, they would have no way to know that there would be something better down the pike. Right now, uh, they would know nothing that of anything being better coming along. So, uh, they would be called least in the kingdom of heaven because they would lead people astray and teach false doctrine. But whoever does them and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now this is uh, something that's phenomenal right here because uh, just think to yourself. Now I'm going to read it again. But whoever does them, that is, follows the Mosaic law and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, how many people do you know who have followed the law perfectly? I know of one, Jesus Christ. That's it. And guess what? He is great in the kingdom of heaven. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. So, uh, anyone who thinks they can be saved by the law, by the Mosaic law, is foolish. And people who think that they're going to be saved because they do not work on Sunday, they're foolish. Because first of all, the Sabbat, as it is in Hebrew, is celebrated or observed on the Sabbat, which is Saturday, not Sunday. So uh, the Christians come along and say, we must follow the Sabbath and then change the day and put it on Sunday and think they're being holy. We are not Israelites. What are you doing following the Sabbat? Now the people in Israel still follow the Sabbath, and it's on Saturday. Actually, sundown on Friday, if you ever see Jerusalem, I looked at it on, the web, on a web page the other day. On Friday, it's all hustle and bustle, and they're all bustling and going to the market. And then, right about sundown, woof, all the people are gone. Well, they're about to observe the Sabbath on a Saturday. And that's when the Sabbath was designed to be. And it's for Jews, not for us. So for the Jew, they were not to do away with the Mosaic Law at that time. So the audience is still a Jewish audience, and the Mosaic Law at this time was still very much in use. And remember, Christ developed the Mosaic Law and uh, presented it to the Jews. Gentiles did not follow the Mosaic Law. And we are Gentiles. In fact, if we believed in Christ, we're royal family of God, and we have something greater to follow than the Mosaic Law. But we always must keep in mind the audience, because people will say, uh, look, 
you've told me I don't live under the Mosaic law, but Jesus said, uh, look here, uh, for the record, until heaven and uh, earth pass away, and not one uh, yod or seraph will pass from the law until everything becomes a reality. Well, not one yod or seraph has passed away from the law. In fact, you can look in your Old Testaments and read all about the law, and it's all there just as it was many, many years ago. So it hasn't been changed, but the age has changed, and we live in the church age, and we are to know the mystery doctrines. That's why uh, we aren't to follow covenant theology. What's covenant theology? Covenant theology is what is mostly taught today. There is There are a few who teach dispensationalism. Most of it's covenant theology in which they try to incorporate the lifestyle of the Mosaic Law, the lifestyle of the Jew, into the Christian way of life. Now let me ask you something. How many of you people know someone who is sacrificing lambs? That was part of the Mosaic Law, and it explicitly told people, uh, you must take a sheep and cut its throat and it must bleed. And this would be a reference to Jesus Christ dying on the substitute for your sins as a lamb without, without spot or blemish. And it was a teaching tool. How many people are doing that today? Not even the Jews are doing that today. So we, we don't live under that. We don't have to sacrifice lambs. And we don't have to do that because Christ has already been sacrificed on our behalf. So it is ridiculous to think that we are under the Mosaic Law. And if you ever run across somebody who uh, praises themselves for not working on Sunday, then ask them, uh, why do they go to a restaurant after church? That would be in violation of the Mosaic Law. But they're not Israelites. They don't know this, though. But they, they praise themselves for following the Mosaic Law. And ask them, when was the last time you made a sacrifice for your sins, buddy? Now, you don't really ask them this, but just think about it to yourself. Think about if somebody is uh, so uh, high and mighty because they've been following the Mosaic Law, we'll say, well, uh, when was the last time you sacrificed uh, your sins to atone for them? Well, they wouldn't, they would think you were nuts, but they're the ones who are nuts. They're the one, they're following a portion of the Mosaic Law. That portion they think they can follow. And no one's ever completely followed the Mosaic Law to a T except Jesus Christ. And the second person who came close to it but still never did is the Apostle Paul. That was before he was saved. Before the Apostle Paul was saved, he was extremely religious, a zealot. And he followed the law. I mean, there was you would not be able to catch the Apostle Paul infringing on the law, except when he murdered Christians. But this is the way self-righteousness goes, and they don't even know what they're doing. Well, if you are going to say Sunday's the Sabbath, then you too must be uh, sacrificing lambs. It's a different age. And that's what that green book there that Jimmy has talks all about, dispensations. And it deals very specifically with the fact that we live in a different age. Now tomorrow we'll begin with Matthew 5.21. And this deals with a mental attitude sin of murder. And then, of course, we'll talk about adultery. And that's probably about as far as we'll go tomorrow. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we've noted and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. And Father, we pray for our president that you will give him a wisdom in dealing with this war on terrorism and that you will confuse the counsel of the wicked and the counsel of our enemies. And may you, if it be your will, continue to shield us from the onslaught of terrorist attacks. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.